And hello once again. Welcome to In Your Corner. John Skoll, Savannah Tamarkin, James Farman ready to talk about disability and injury law. You want to reach out anytime during the show, 1 855 821 5900 and help at inyourcorner.ca. Uh, James, how are you, pal? Take it away. We're going to start right now. I can't complain. Thanks right. for asking. Good. So, on this show, what we're trying to do is we're trying to educate our viewers about what they can do during the process when they have a disability claim and once they've started, what we will do to help them. So today I want to focus on something that can be done before we get involved. So when you're dealing with your insurance company, you're dealing with the adjuster, and if they are doing something that you feel is incorrect or they're asking you to do something that you're not sure about or you feel like they're about to cut you off, this is critical. Put everything in writing. If it's possible, you want to communicate only by email. That's ideal. It won't always happen. A lot of adjusters will just refuse to operate that way. So be it. If that's the case, you make sure that you keep a pen and paper handy with you. And when your adjuster calls, you say, excuse me for a moment. I just need a minute so I can get a pen and paper. And don't continue the conversation until you have that. Take notes during the conversation. The moment the conversation is over, you go to your computer or your phone and you draft an email to the adjuster summarizing exactly what was said so that there is a record that cannot be disputed. If when the adjuster gets that and the adjuster, if the adjuster disagrees with anything that is in there, then they will do it then and there. But if they don't say anything when you send this email, if they don't respond back saying, oh no, I never said this, or you never said that, if they don't put that in writing then and there, then no one is going to take their word from it six months down the road or a year down the road. It's there in writing. They didn't bother to deny it at the time. Silence so it's a fact. Sentence. That's right. It's a fact at that point. Nice. When you do that, number one, you're telling the insurance company that you're not just going to take whatever they say at face value, that you are going to make sure that there is a record of everything that is said. And number two, if and when they do cut you off, you will be in a much better position down the road to dispute what has gone on, to make sure that your side of the story has been recorded and cannot be denied. It's so important you say that on the show because it seems like such a little bit of homework, but I bet you so few people bother to do it. They yeah, just say, it, okay, bye, click. And it makes an enormous difference. Number one, it will probably prolong the period of time that you're getting your benefits because if the insurance company is under the view that, you know, they're going to be able to terminate you and you're just going to go easily, this will give them a moment of pause. Yeah. This will make them think, okay, Maybe we got to be a little bit more careful with this Cats one. on the ball. So the first, the first point is it's going to prolong how long you're getting your benefits for. And number two, if and when they cut you off, of course, you're in a better position. InYourCorner.ca is the website. And coming up in just a bit, five top mistakes your LTD lawyer should not make in handling your claim. But some do. But first, a week, there was something that's been going on with you, pal. What's up? Yeah, John, I had a lady, 48-year-old woman, call me. She has severe depression, and it's because of her sister who died in an accident a while back. Uh, she worked as an account executive at a uh, large company making about $85,000 a year. Now, her insurance company, her long-term disability insurer, sent her to a therapist. And she had a few sessions with that therapist, and at some point, the therapist wrote a letter, a report, stating that now she's all better, or she's better than she was, and she's ready to go back to work. Well, her own family doctor disagreed with that, but regardless, the insurance company then relied on that letter from that therapist to cut her off benefits. So what does the family doctor do? He tells her to go see a psychologist that he recommends. Mm -hmm. And that's happened a few months back, about three and a half months ago, and she's been seeing that person. And that psychologist, the new psychologist, wrote a letter as well saying, no, she's absolutely not ready to go back to work. So what does she do? She then submits the letter from that new psychologist and her family doctor as part of an appeal to the insurance company. And of course, last week, she gets her denial from the insurance company. And that's something we talk about all the time here, denials uh, as a result of appeals, that you should not be appealing these kinds of cutoffs or denials of long-term disability. Now. Uh, three mistakes that she had done that many people in her position do and make. Number one, she went to a therapist that the insurance company told her to go to as opposed to finding one on her own or going to her doctor for a recommendation. And that's what we always tell people. Go to your doctor, have them recommend someone to you. Number two, she appealed that cutoff. And of course, what do we know about appeals? They do not work. As soon as you appeal, you are leaving the power over your claim in the hands of the insurance company. How do you not leave the, the, the power in, in, in their hands is uh, you start a legal claim. 
That takes the power away from them and puts it in your hands. The third mistake that she did is she didn't call us at the outset. Because John, people who get cut off long-term disability rarely are cut off uh, as a surprise. They're usually told in advance, up. yeah, they give you the heads up. You're gonna be cut off in a month, in three months, in eight months. As soon as that happens, that's when you pick up the phone. In fact, you could pick up the phone even before that when you sense some trouble that's brewing. And some people do that because, you know, then we can intervene, we can actually step in and either prevent a cutoff or we take action before the payments actually stop. And we've had cases, both James and I, where the person was told, you're gonna get cut off in three or four or five months. We've stepped in and we've achieved a resolution, a settlement with the insurance company without those payments having been cut off. So there's no period of time where you have no money coming in, which is the worst thing that can happen. Okay, James, something we, we covered on a recent radio show, that treatment uh, professional laid out by the insurance company, is that not mandatory or just an assessment? Do you have to go to their treating doctor or just to get assessed? Is no, there a difference? There's definitely a difference. And I want to make sure that our viewers understand the distinction between treatment and assessment. Okay. So under your policy, there are two things that you're required to do when it comes to seeing doctors. Number one, you're required to get appropriate treatment. So that does not mean that the insurance company is entitled to choose who you get your treatment from, but it does mean that your insurance company can insist that you get reasonable treatment. Okay. What reasonable treatment means can be disputed. You know, one doctor might think this is reasonable, another might think another thing is reasonable. And so it may well be the case that they are suggesting treatment that you ought to get, even if it's from your own doctor, and you refuse because your own doctor says, no, I don't think that's reasonable. But that's another story. The other thing we're talking about, though, is assessment. So an assessment is an insurance company wanting to get a medical opinion from a doctor, usually, uh, in order to inform themselves on their decision. And it's usually to justify making a decision that they've already made. But in any case, it goes in their file and it's used as part of the decision-making process. You can't refuse to go see whichever doctor they choose for an assessment. Because okay. the assessment is not about your, your, your health or your future it's care. The treatment. That is just for the insurance company's benefit in order to inform the insurance company, and they are entitled to do that. You don't have the choice to say, no, I won't see this person for an assessment. Okay. For treatment, you have that choice. You have your choice, it's your health, right? That's right. Okay. one 821 5900 is the number. Email is help at inyourcorner.ca. First email of the day comes from Russell Guy, says, my LTD adjuster has, just, uh, has been harassing me lately. He calls me every week and says he needs more information. Uh, if I don't give him to him, he'll, he'll cut me off, is what he's saying. He recently sent a letter saying that my parents will stop, uh, my payments rather, will stop soon because I've reached the old 24 month point. I'm 52 and I'm not ready to go back to work. My doctor says that I still need treatments because, uh, before I can go back. My husband wants me to appeal, but I'm too stressed to do so. We've heard that before. So, I mean, we see this quite a lot happen with where, where people are told that at the 24 month mark of being on LTD, they're gonna get cut off. And people need to understand that uh, for the first 24 months, all you have to show is that you are disabled from working in your own occupation, your own job. Beyond the 24 month mark, the test then expands. It becomes, can you work in any occupation, but not just in any occupation, it's any occupation for which you have training or experience or education. And that's very, very important because what happens is that most people think that their benefits simply end at that two year mark, the 24 month mark, and they take it at face value. Here, Russell is saying, uh, first of all, that his uh, adjuster is harassing him, which is not appropriate. Although again, we do see that quite often happen, people feeling harassed and bullied by their adjusters. And by the way, as soon as we step in, that communication between the adjuster and the individual stops. The adjuster is not allowed then to communicate with the individual. They have to go through us. So that's very important. But what's more important here is that Russell needs to understand, first of all, not to listen uh, to, to what his husband is saying and, and appeal that decision, as we've spoken about. These appeals lead you nowhere. But in fact, if he's going to be cut off, as the insurance company has said that he will, we can start a legal claim right now. As long as we have his doctors writing that he's unable to go back to any form of work for which he has, he has education experience uh, or, or, or training, then he should be getting those benefits, those LTD benefits beyond that two year mark. And we can get that for him. That's the reality. Don't simply walk away from the claim or appeal those decisions.
I, I want to talk about another aspect of Russell's email. So at the beginning, he spoke about the harassment that he's getting from his adjuster, and that is something that is not at all uncommon. We see this regularly, not in every case. Some adjusters are quite pleasant and will treat you with respect. Some will not. And I, I don't know what Russell's disability is. He hasn't mentioned that in his email. But especially if it's a mental health disability, this is really, really troubling when this happens. It makes it so much harder than the process needs to be, and it's difficult to begin with. So if you're in that situation, if you're being harassed by your adjuster, you need to speak up. You need to speak up and make sure that there is a record that you believe that you are being harassed. And how do you do that? Well, we go right back to what I was talking about at the beginning of the show. You make sure that you do that in writing. You make sure that you request that there is another adjuster placed on your file because you believe you are being treated disrespectfully, that you are being harassed. They may or may not agree to switch adjusters, but at the very least, if they do not agree to switch adjusters and they cut you off and we have to bring a legal claim in order to get your benefits, you're going to be in a much stronger position because you will be able to say, this adjuster was harassing me, he was making my situation that much worse, and because of that, I'm worse off now than I would have been anyway, and there's a record of it. Here it is. I sent this email. This shows exactly what my complaint was, and they did nothing about it. Now, Russell says, you know, at that 24-month point, now you go into the, you know, training, education, or experience. You're passing your own occupation test. Now, when they say education experience, it doesn't mean that if Russell's a chemical engineer, he can go be a greeter at a large retailer. That's not what they mean, right? That's a, that's a very good point. I mean, that's obvious. Of course he could do that, but or so, not, but... The first thing you have to do is you have to look at a policy. And so some insurance policies will set out a minimum amount or minimum percentage of your pre-disability income cool. that if you don't, if you're not able to earn more than that, you'll still be entitled to benefits. Usually it's somewhere around the amount of the actual benefit you're receiving. So somewhere around 60% or so, if it's set out in the policy. If it isn't set out in the policy, the courts generally will apply what's called a commensurate earnings test. And that essentially means about 60%. So, you know, if you are a doctor or a professional or, you know, an executive making six figures and you become disabled, that does not mean that you now have to take a minimum wage job. It means that if you're not able to earn something commensurate, so around 60% or so of what you had been earning when you became disabled, then you will still qualify for your benefits. 1-855-821-5900 is the number to reach out. The top five mistakes LTD lawyers should not make in handling your case, but some do. That is on the way as well. Stick around. Lots more in your corner is coming right up. You were being harassed, and when you said something about it, you're the one who lost your job. Now what are you going to do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. Insurance companies deny long-term disability claims all the time. They give lots of excuses. Don't give up. I've seen it all. They've ignored your doctors. They've ignored you. You're angry and you're frustrated. But there's hope. We resolve disability claims all the time. We force insurers to pay what they owe. We're in your corner. Call Savan and his team, 1-855-821-5900, or go to inyourcorner.ca. You thought you had a secure job. You didn't see it coming. Now what do you do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. And welcome back to In Your Corner. You want to reach out anytime, even when the show is not on your, uh, your TV set. 1-855-821-5900. Help at inyourcorner.ca. Or quite simply, inyourcorner.ca is the website. As mentioned, guys, the top five mistakes your LTD lawyer should not make in handling your claim, but some do. We'll get right into it. Number one, missing the most crucial deadline for starting your legal claim against the insurance company. That is an extremely important deadline. And yeah. we're not talking about the appeal deadline. Okay, which we see some lawyers telling their clients that they should appeal a decision. You can, you know, you have to come to me, sign the retainer right now because we only have 30 days or two days left on that 30 day period. No, nonsense. The most important date uh, or the most important deadline you have to remember is that two year mark for starting a legal claim. 
the two-year mark or, the, or that clock starts running from the date of first denial. So, you know, if the first denial that you received for your LTD or you were cut off LTD January 1st, 2019, that's two years from that date, okay? It's not 30 days from that date, it's not a month from that date, it's not three years, it's two years. That said, John, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that you have to wait until that two-year mark, which again, we see a lot of lawyers do. You'll go to a lawyer, you'll tell the lawyer, I was denied long-term disability last week or last month. The lawyer will have you sign a retainer agreement and then you don't hear from that lawyer for months or a year or a year and a half. Why? Why? I mean, this is a time when you're not getting any money coming in. You have bills piling high. This is something that we take very seriously at our firm. We understand that there is pressure on you, pressure on your family. We have to move the case fast, lightning fast now. So that two-year deadline that we're talking about here, that should actually not even come into play. I mean, if you have a lawyer that you've hired right after you were cut off, we should not have to be dealing with that two-year mark. We have to start that claim now, within days of you coming to us. Something else your lawyer should not be doing, your LTD lawyer, and if they are, it's a big mistake, and that is letting you communicate directly with the insurance company after you've retained them. Never happen. It should never, ever happen. So I mean, we go back to the email that we did just before Russell. the break. Russell's email, yep. that's right. Russell was talking about being harassed by his adjuster, which is not uncommon. But even if you're not being harassed by your adjuster, this is a stressful process. This is you know, your income. This is you know, money in your pocket that is no longer coming in. And you're dealing with a very large corporation that has billions of dollars, that knows disability law inside and out, and you don't know what you're doing because you've never had to do this before. And so, yeah, there's a huge power imbalance there. And for most people, they would just as soon not have to ever talk to anyone from the insurance company again. Well, the good news is, the moment you sign the retainer, you're not going to have to at all anymore. We will handle all communication with the insurance company from the moment you sign the retainer until the moment we have your case resolved. We are talking the top five things your LTD lawyer should not be doing. If they are, uh, you got to wonder why. Number three is not explaining the legal claim process to you in full detail and answering all of your questions. So that's something that, again, I get quite a lot. People come to me, whether it's for second opinions or third opinions, or just they're coming to me because they've read things on Google. And they don't understand what the process is. And, you know, the lack of understanding, the lack of knowledge, uh, that breeds anxiety. So compound that with having to deal with an adjuster who may be harassing you or dealing with you in an unfair way, and you have a recipe for you getting worse, not getting better. And so one of the things that we take, again, very seriously, and we take our time doing, is explaining the entire process to you. Telling you from A to Z exactly what to expect. What, 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 is the, uh, what to expect in terms of not just the process, but the overall outcome as well. Looking over the documents, explaining how the legal claims process works, explaining the psychology of the insurance company. And listen, we will be there as long as you need us. We will explain or provide you answers to whatever questions you have. And frankly, James and I love it when people come to us with a list of questions. Mm -hmm. Some people call us and tell me, you know, I spoke with this one lawyer and as soon as I start asking, you know, three or more questions, they put the phone down or they become, you know, they became abrupt, like I, I'm invading on, on their time. You bothering know? them. Bothering them. No, this is a service that we are providing. You are entitled to get these answers. And frankly, a more informed client is a better client for us. It allows us to then advance their case in a much more efficient way. So explaining the full scope of the process, that calms people down. It gives them more power, decision-making power, and frankly makes our lives much easier in terms of handling their claim and advancing their cause. You know, the, the real test isn't how, how much that lawyer is willing to talk to you when they're trying to get your business. Right. The real test is how available they're going to be after you've signed that retainer. And that is something that I and everyone in our group takes extreme pride in. When any of our clients has any questions at all, we are there for them. And at every stage of the process, we will have our clients come in and spend as much time as necessary to prepare them for whatever comes next, whether it's for mediation or if it need be an examination or, you know, God forbid, having to go all the way to court, which very rarely ever happens. We make sure that our clients are completely prepared so they know as well as possible what is coming, what it's going to look like what they should expect. That's when you really want your lawyer communicating with you when you're in the mud, right? right. When it gets dirty. Anyone can do it at the outset. Right. The real test is what you're doing all along the entire claim. 
Top five mistakes your LTD lawyer should not make uh, handling your claim, but some do. Number four, I know you like this one, James, not getting the necessary medical reports for your case to make sure your case is as strong as it possibly could be. Sure. I mean, any disability case is really going to come down to the medical opinions, whether your doctors believe that you're able to work or not. But there is very specific language that is used in most disability policies that is applied to determine whether or not you're entitled to your benefits. And it isn't the case that every doctor is familiar with what that wording is, what the critical question that needs to be answered, which is more or less, are you able to return to your own occupation? And so what we want to make sure of is that your treating doctors are aware of what that test is and that they have addressed that in their records specifically. So we want to first and foremost get that from treating doctors. And in some cases, it's necessary to go a step further and we'll get a report from a medical expert, a specialist who deals with the type of disability that you have. And this has all kinds of benefits. Number one, we have a roster of experts that are leading practitioners in their particular fields. These are leading doctors in Canada, people that you otherwise may not have access to right. who are going to see you. So they are going to provide a legal report that we can use to build the evidence in your case to make it that much stronger so the insurer knows if they want to test us in court, they're going to have a very big mountain to climb because we've got an expert, a leader in their field that says you cannot return to work. Number two, and maybe more importantly, that access to the doctor is going to result in a report. And we don't just take the report and use it for the claim. We're going to give our clients two copies of that report. One copy they keep for themselves in their own records so they can reference it whenever they want. And the other copy is for their family doctor. So their family doctor is aware of what our experts are saying is necessary for your treatment down the road. And that's critical. You have access to some of the best doctors in Canada when necessary, and that can really help you recover. The top five mistakes your LTD lawyer should not be making. The fifth and final one is this, guys. This is one at the end of the road, and that is settling your case for much less than it's worth. John, you'd be amazed how much, how, how often that happens. And, and I speak not only as someone who has uh, had people come to me who are on the verge of settlement with another lawyer, but also as somebody who used to work for insurance companies. Right. And I would be on the opposite end. My job would be to pay as little as possible to an individual. And I can tell you, uh, just think about it this way. If your claim is worth a million dollars and I can pry open that door, which is exactly what we're trying to do with insurance companies through the legal claims process, and if I can increase the settlement value of your claim by just 10%, that's another $100,000 that otherwise you would not have gotten. And how would you know as, a, as an individual out there with no knowledge about it? You wouldn't know, which is why you have to do your homework from the beginning. Who you choose to represent you will dictate the result of your case ultimately. Because you can have the best case in the world, but if you have a lawyer who doesn't know what they're doing or will sell you out for a quick settlement, you're gonna end up with 10 cents on the dollar. Extremely, extremely important. You do not want to be on the receiving end of that kind of a situation. And you guys have mentioned as well that your insurance company knows, you know, the, the Barney Rubbles yes. down the corner who really don't know what they're they doing. Right? They know, they know. When I, again, when I did defense work working yeah. for insurer, I'm telling you, one of the first things I would look at when I would look at a legal claim, who's representing this person? Because insurance companies know who are the quality lawyers, yeah. who are the quality Weak. firms, yeah. who will go the distance, who will put firepower behind those claims. And they know which ones will sell their clients out. And they know. And the interesting thing apart, uh, about that is the assessment at the beginning is really critical. Because when the insurance company assesses the value of your claim at the outset, they have to put money aside for how much they think Right. your case is going to settle for down the road and what they're going to have to spend to get that done. And if part of that assessment is that you have a lawyer that doesn't know what they're doing, that assessment is going to be much lower. Right. And to change that down the road is very difficult because this won't be a shock to you. Insurance companies are a bit of a bureaucracy. They have a little bit of red tape going on. Yeah. So in order to change that reserve, in order to get more money for the, for the insurance adjuster to get more money to pay off your claim, they have to go through all kinds of hurdles to get there. So you want to make sure you get it right nice. at the very beginning. Email address is help at inyourcorner.ca. We'll get to an email here before break. Eleanor writes in, says, I was denied a long-term disability last year and went to a lawyer who said he could help, but nothing has happened with my claim for a year and a half, like you just mentioned. Uh, the lawyer kept asking for medical documents and contacted the insurance adjuster, but that's it. I'm worried that this may not be the lawyer for me. Is it possible to change lawyers at this stage? 
So it, it's always possible to change lawyers, but it's not necessarily the case that you always should. Right. So, you know, we're always going to, whenever we meet with someone who says, I'm not happy with my lawyer, we're happy to give them a second opinion and talk with them. But that doesn't mean that we're just going to take any case that comes in the door, even if it's a very good case. Because the assessment isn't whether or not we want to handle the case or whether we think it's something that would be profitable for our firm. The assessment is and always has to be what is going to be in the best interest of the client. Are they going to be better served in the end by changing lawyers? And oftentimes the answer is no. If, it's, if the case has been going on for a long period of time and the other lawyer has done a significant amount of work, then it will be very expensive because they're going to have to pay the other lawyer for the work that they've done. And even if I think I can do somewhat better than the other lawyer, if I can't make up for however much they have to pay their other lawyer, right. then it's not worth it. And I will tell you that. Absolutely. Um, there's no reason to, to do it if you're going to be worse off in the end. Unless there's a fundamental breakdown in the relationship with the lawyer, that's what the analysis has to be. Now, in Eleanor's case, you know, I would need to know much more about the situation to really be able to advise her, but it does seem like, you know, if it's been a year and a half and nothing's happened, that's pretty concerning. Okay. As we talk about on the show, we are, you know, very concerned with making sure that we start the claim as soon as possible. And, you know, I don't have any disability cases that have taken me a year and a half to get to a mediation. That just doesn't happen. It's typically about a year or less. It could be significantly less than that. So a year and a half is a really long time, but I would need to know what's happened in order to be able to really say whether or not it's appropriate. Coming up here, what happens if you're being on short-term disability but you're denied LTD? That's on the way. We'll take a short break and get to that. 1-855-821-5900 and help at inyourcorner.ca. This is In Your Corner. Stick around. You lost your job. They only gave you two weeks of severance per year worked. But where can you find out what you're really owed? I'm going to severancepaycalculator.com. Find out how much you're owed right now. Severancepaycalculator.com. You've been denied long-term disability. You think you're powerless, but you have a lot more power than you think. I'll tell you a secret. It's a numbers game for the insurance company. They're betting on you walking away from money that they owe you. Don't make that mistake. We resolve disability claims all the time. We force insurers to pay what they owe. We're in your corner. Call Savan and his team, 1-855-821-5900, or go to inyourcorner.ca. You lost your job. They said they had a good reason, but you think you've been wrongfully dismissed. Now what are you going to do? I'm going to employmentlawyer.ca. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. And welcome back to In Your Corner, MyDisabilityQuestions.com, a great resource for you to ask your questions and get them answered by these guys or a member of the team. We'll get to it. Mika says, uh, my son was bullied and harassed at work and developed severe depression. He has seen several doctors and is taking medication. He was on short-term disability for a few months. He applied for LTD but was denied. The LTD insurer, which is different from the short-term disability insurer, doesn't think that he qualifies for LTD due to insufficient medical documentation. How can it be that one insurer says one thing and another insurer says something else? Because it's insurance companies. You know? <laughs> I mean, that's what we're dealing with. And, and frankly, we see this a lot. I mean, what's more interesting is how situations where you have the same insurance company covering for short-term disability and then long-term, and make one decision on short term and another decision on long term. Right. So listen, at the end of the day, if your doctors are saying that you're unable to go to work because of, of your disability, mm -hmm. well then, then you should qualify for LTD. It's that simple. The test is essentially the same. There is no reason why there is a discrepancy here. And frankly, we should be able to help uh, Mika Sun. There's no question about that. There may be an employment issue here as well, but there is no reason based on the reason that they've given him, insufficient medical documentation, that we wouldn't be able to help. So he can definitely reach out and, and get 100% we'll right? be able to help. Yeah, don't yeah. sit back and wait for it. We're done for another day. A lot of stuff in there. You want to reach out, get a hold of these two guys. Remember a member of the team, that is simple, 1-855-821-5900, the email address we use. And read from on this show is help at inyourcorner.ca and the website overall to find our radio shows as well is inyourcorner.ca as well. Hope you enjoyed the show. We will catch you next time on In Your Corner. Good.